Welcome back and thank you for joining us for Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study. We are up to episode 124 and the second chapter of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2. Mm -hmm. So yesterday was the introductory chapter where Paul says, I heard from Chloe's house, I got this letter while I've been in Ephesus, mm -hmm. that your church isn't doing great because there's divisions in your church. You're full of pride. Spiritual pride is the main issue, which is the underlying issue in every sin. But... Um, some are saying they follow Paul, some are saying they follow Apollos, some are mm -hmm. saying they're followers of Peter, and uh, basically they're, they're comparing themselves to one another by their accomplishments and their connections in the world, and Paul says that is not what Christ intends for you. He wants unity in your church, not mm -hmm. divisions based on personal pride and ego. Mm -hmm. So. That brings us to chapter two, which uh, is a further explanation of this. The first four chapters or so of Ephesians, I'm sorry, First Corinthians, all are on this topic really of spiritual pride and the damages it causes. And where the Corinthians should be finding their identity, which is in the blood of Jesus Christ and their status uh, as his children, God's children through Christ. Make sure to read through your copy of First Corinthians two at home. Here is my personal paraphrase. Paul says that not only were the Corinthians sort of unimpressive in the world's uh, eyes, but he himself was also not effective due to his eloquence or wisdom. The only thing Paul did was preach the gospel to the Corinthians, but that gospel was powerful and the Holy Spirit accomplished his desired results through it. Paul reasons that the message of the gospel of Christ is full of wisdom but it's not the wisdom of the world's rulers, uh, obviously since the world's rulers are actually the ones who crucified Jesus. But this wisdom is so counterintuitive, so glorious, that no human has ever seen, ever heard, ever comprehended, or even imagined anything like the wisdom of God. And Paul is essentially quoting here at this point a, a spot from Isaiah 64. Only the Spirit of God truly understands the wisdom of God, and therefore someone without the Spirit of God, this is a really important concept, somebody without the Spirit of God cannot process the wisdom and the beauty of the gospel, but rather it only seems foolish to them. The counterintuitive truths of the kingdom of God, in other words, are only spiritually discerned. Paul is establishing the point that since the Spirit of Christ dwells inside of us, and since Christ is God, then we are all privileged to know the instruction of the mind of the Lord. Okay, so that's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, a couple mm -hmm. points to dissect there. Any initial reactions to that? Well, this is where I say that Paul says a lot of things without saying, like, what is he saying? He doesn't yeah. make sense. <laughs> So connection, communication is a two-way street, and so either the person doing communicating mm -hmm. is not doing a very good job, or the person who is receiving the communication mm -hmm. is not doing an awesome job of discerning what is being said. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about the inspired word of God, mm -hmm. where do you think the communication <laughs> breakdown here might be taking place? I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're saying, and I'm, he's so, and I'm just saying. He's so like flowery all the time. Yeah. Again, the more... I mean, maybe I shouldn't say that because I know it is the Holy Spirit, but not everyone writes this way. Well, the more you read it, the more it makes sense and doesn't seem like well, just Well, how fluff. can I understand it unless someone explains it to me? There you go. Acts 8. Uh, but that's the thing here. The, the very point that... One of the points that we're going to make here is the very point that you're talking about here. It's spiritually discerned. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not just intellectually discerned. And therefore, you don't expect a non-believer to read this mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, that makes total sense. Now I believe. Now I believe. Mm -hmm. Because it's not merely an intellectual thing. And there are also, therefore, any kind of spiritual discernment of Scripture, there's a spiritual maturity attached to it. It requires you to grow in spiritual maturity in order to fully appreciate all I feel all like you're you insulting me. A little bit. <laughs> well, you were insulting Scripture a little bit. So I, I, I'm trying to very humbly point out the problem here is probably not Paul's writing style. Mm. The problem here is we have fleshy hearts, hard hearts, mm -hmm. that, um, again, just operate out of the, the wisdom and the, the desires of the flesh. And therefore, maybe we're missing something. And maybe the more we study it, the more we dig into it, the more we'll find the brilliance of it. So, devotional thought number one. Uh, the Apostle Paul's skill set. So there are several different points in the New Testament where we get Paul's sort of like resume and his mm -hmm. qualifications. One is in Philippians chapter 3 where he talks about rising up through the Pharisee party and he studies under this famous uh, 
rabbi named Gamaliel, and he was he was like tabbed as being a future leader for the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in other words, he clearly has some kind of skills. Uh, he says almost the exact same thing in Acts 22 when he's on trial uh, before the Jews in Jerusalem. Um, he also demonstrates, he not only says, here's who I was, he demonstrates his intellectual capacity and his debate in Acts chapter 17 when he's before a lot of academic mm -hmm. Roman philosophers, Greek philosophers. And therefore, I think what we have to conclude here is when Paul says, I came to you in Corinthians, not with uh, eloquence and wisdom, he's not saying, as I've sometimes heard, he's not saying, I'm not very smart. Mm -hmm. In fact... Uh, I had a so my Bible says he is a brilliant scholar. Yeah, and they're saying that specifically to counteract what the false impression of Paul. Some people will interpret this to say Paul is saying I'm not very intelligent or I'm mm -hmm. not very eloquent or I'm not. That's not what he's saying. Um, and interestingly, I had a teacher once who said he didn't sing a specific verse of. So there's this kind of famous hymn, "Hark the Voice of Jesus Crying." Okay, you know what that one is. Hark the voice of Jesus crying, who will go and work today? Fields are ripe and harvest waiting, who will bear the sheaves away loud and long? I know, okay. and I don't know what a sheep is. <laughs> well, anyways, it's basically ends with this idea of here am I, send me, send me. Uh -huh. I'm ready to go. And one of the verses, I think it's maybe the third verse, it says, if you cannot speak like angels, if mm -hmm. you cannot preach like Paul, yeah. you can tell the love of Jesus. You can say he died for all. Uh -huh. One of my teachers once said, yeah, I don't sing that verse. Mm -hmm. I said, what? He's like, I don't sing that verse because I don't think it's well written. Like, because uh -huh. Paul says he doesn't come with great, eloquent, wise preaching. So like, we shouldn't be comparing it to if you cannot preach like Paul, you can still tell mm -hmm. the love of Jesus. We shouldn't be elevating Paul's preaching. But he could preach that way, he just chose not to, right? Here's what I think Paul is saying. He's clearly not unintelligent, he's clearly not uneducated, and he's clearly not uh, non-eloquent in a sense. The Areopagus would not have heard him present mm -hmm. all these ideas and been impressed with him if he wasn't yeah. wise and eloquent. I think what he's saying here is the spiritual impact that was made on my mission trips, including in Corinth, mm -hmm. was not because I was wise, educated, or eloquent. Yeah. The spiritual impact was made because of the power of the gospel alone. Uh, my ministerial efficacy, in mm -hmm. other words, is not specifically because of my giftedness. Mm -hmm. Even though it's God's the one who gave the gifts anyways, it's because of the power of the gospel. And he's, it's, he, I think he's going out of his way to remain humble before Corinthians here, mm -hmm. who, remember, they're very worldly. They're very obsessed with gifts. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to struggle with a group called the super apostles who are showing themselves as even more credible than Paul. Um, but Paul, his whole ministry was spent not selling them on his goodness mm -hmm. and his talents and his insights. His ministry was spent uh, selling them on the goodness of Jesus Christ, which is totally the right ministerial approach, by the way. Yeah. Like minis ministry leaders should never be trying to mm -hmm. say, well, you should trust me because I'm credible. Yeah. Even though credibility is a thing, they should be saying, you should trust God. Mm -hmm. Like, don't bank on my goodness because you're just going to be disappointed. Bank on the goodness yeah. of Christ. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what he's doing here. He's not saying he's unintelligent. He's not saying he's you know completely not eloquent or anything like that. Um, second devotional thought, the world ultimately rejects Christianity. And I think without the encouragement to have like a martyr complex here, I think we all know what that is. It's the idea that, okay, if I'm going to follow after Christ, then I need to suffer constantly in every possible way and if i'm not suffering then i'm not a real christian kind of thing uh, without having a martyr complex you do need to recognize the underlying reality of a fallen world and christians um, sometimes are desperate to gain a claim in the world and gain status and um, i don't know if it's a representation or critical mass but it seems like christians get really excited the moment like the moment i get a really christian good athlete out there like a tim tebow mm -hmm. or i get a christian music artist like a lauren daigle with like crossover appeal oh she was on grays her or, music was on grays yeah she's really made it or if i can if i can get a the right christian politician in office mm -hmm. like then then we'll really do some mm -hmm. kingdom impact and it's like no, don't forget that at the end of the day, the world rejects Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's proven by the fact that at the time of Jesus himself, both the religious Jewish leaders and the political, irreligious 
secular Romans rejected Jesus Christ. And therefore, you do not try to work in such a way that the world does not understand Christ. You don't try to, you don't try to make the world understand you. You try to. Uh, you try to look different than the world. You right. You try to glorify God, being yeah. filled with the Spirit of God, even though the world might reject you. Mm-hmm. And some are gonna. That is gonna look different. And some are gonna be compelled by that. But many are going to reject, and therefore trying to gain the approval or the favor of the world is mm-hmm. like just not necessary. And he's, he's explaining that point to them here. Corinthians, who are obsessed with, again, worldliness and mm-hmm. worldly approval. Um, devotional thought number three, I guess, then, is the spiritual truths are spiritually discerned. Did you want to jump in there? No, are you saying it like, I guess we're moving on because... And you're not saying anything. Usually, I do like a, this whole, this is a peek behind the scenes here. It's kind of like a little bit of a double dutch sort of, or um, what is it, volleying back and forth kind of thing. Uh-huh. And I'll give my summary and then I'll say, hey, anything to throw in there? <laughs> and uh, I'll say like, okay, let's go to with our devotional thoughts. And uh, I've like jotted down, always have prepared several different devotional thoughts. And after each one, I'll say, Any, do you want to respond to that? And sometimes you just say, uh-huh, <laughs> and I'll, or uh-uh, and sometimes you uh, want to go with it. So I want to make sure that I'm always giving you plenty of opportunity to respond there if you have anything to mm-hmm. ask or jump in on or anything like that. So yeah, No, well, he didn't allow me that pause after the first point because... Uh-oh. I feel like there are so many... It's, it's, really, it's really hard, I think, to be... A Christian with any kind of success because um, so like a pastor like you do kind of have to market yourself in some way and I think sometimes that's difficult to do as um, like as a Christian can I ask what you mean by market yourself so if you like let's say you I don't know if a pastor is even a good example like let's say you own a small business and you are selling something you have to market yourself in a certain way to be like I use this product and look how look at look right. it's working for me yep. and sometimes that right. doesn't yeah. coincide with Christianity in in some ways and I don't know how you balance so even like there are um, some pastors that are very successful like have successful books or podcasts or whatever and if you look at their Instagram, they are describing like, this is my name and this is what I'm about. I'm a husband, father. Yeah. Like it is about them in some ways. Right. And maybe you have to be like that in some way. Like why would I listen to you or why would I relate to you? Um, right. But like, yeah. I don't know. I guess I never see, so I never see like Tim Keller do any kind of self-promotion. If anything, right. he does self, it's not deprecation, but... Yeah, he's more like Paul than like. He's very clearly some humble. Other, yeah, maybe yeah. that's what it is. Yeah, part of his attractiveness is. Like he doesn't try to be funny. He doesn't try to be anything. Extra- he's not. Extraordinary giftedness. Because he knows it's not about him. Matched with extraordinary humility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to find, I think, in people who have any any semblance of worldly success. I love one of my favorite lines from a New Testament character is John the Baptist, where he is getting gaining this enormous mass of followers, mm-hmm. and he says, "I must become lesser, and he must become greater." Mm-hmm. And that is such a good posture and attitude. And um, you know, it's it's much easier said than done. Mm-hmm. Although even a lot of us maybe struggle even to say it. Um, and again, it goes back to the worldly insecurities that we talked about in the last chapter with because I, I know a lot of pastors who struggle with like, okay, my identity is wrapped up in like even my title. Mm-hmm. Like uh, you, you have to call me pastor. You so got so. mad. So when we went down to the Ark Encounter and we tried to find like our plank that we sponsored and we found it and it said pastor and Adrian Hine, you were like, my name is not Pastor. It's something, I don't even like it as a... I'm like, I don't know why I put that. It's something that I do, uh, like an office that I carry out. It's not my It's not my identity. You know, I was thinking about this in yesterday's thing when we were talking about where you find your identity. And I always think it's interesting, like, if you ask someone to, like, oh, like, say a little bit about who you are. Yeah. Like, what people will say first. Yeah. Like, yep. I would probably say I'm Absolutely. a nurse. Absolutely. The, whether you talk about what you do for a living, mm-hmm. uh, what 
how many kids you have. Mm -hmm. um, these are roles that you play. It's not to say these are unimportant things. Uh, somebody who, if you went to an Ivy League college, you will tell people that. <laughs> right? uh, it's because that's your that's your identity is wrapped up in that particular thing. And so, like the even if you know people I know genuinely are just sharing some detailed bullet points about their life, but your identity has to be. You know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Uh -huh. I am just supremely loved by a, a, a gracious God and that is everything that I am and I'm an heir of eternal life but that's that's the thing though like okay so like talking about like a Lauren Daigle like as any yeah. Christian it's difficult to know like is that what I'm supposed to say if I'm at a party a work party and someone's like oh everyone say a little bit I'm like I'm a sinner saved by grace like am I just a weirdo at that point yeah. Like, how do you know? And should I be a weirdo? And is that fine? Yeah. Or, like, should I... I don't know. It's hard. Be more like the world to get the world to listen to you? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's, it's probably a little bit contextual. And you read... Ministry sometimes is reading the room and reading the moment. Mm -hmm. And looking for opportunities to introduce people to Christ. Um, I, I think for sure what it means is you're not afraid to say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ, mm -hmm. um, you know, disciple of Jesus. Here's what I, I mean. Here's what I mean by that. I think I'm a deeply broken person that God uh, has rescued, you know, yeah. and I'm just incredibly grateful for that. I guess I would say, yeah, you shouldn't be afraid to say it by any means. Um, I sometimes think it would be more impactful, though, if we actually just lived like we were followers of Christ in more extreme and visible ways. Yeah, I don't, I just don't. And then you wouldn't have to say it. Right. Or. I think you still would have well, to say yeah. it. Well, yeah. I think it's it's not like that. Again, what we tend to do, I've ranted on this before. What we tend to do simplistically is we turn it into an either or. Mm -hmm. When right. it's very clearly yeah. a both and type situation. Mm -hmm. You can't, you cannot communicate the gospel entirely to somebody through your lifestyle. There has to be verbal right. articulation. Yes, because there means. are a lot of nice, generous people who are not. Correct. Christians. Yep. So. I don't know why they're nice and generous. Like I struggle to be both of those. That's things. a different. That's a different uh, lesson. But we'll talk at some point. Remind me. We'll talk about the various the motivations. Just in general, there's mm -hmm. all sorts of motivations. Guilt is powerful. For pride is powerful. Fear is powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, motivations for behaviors are all over the board. The only way that they end up becoming productive motivations is if they're gospel-driven motivations. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, the. What you do in, in certain social settings is, again, I, I would hesitate. Pat, another thing that Christians are sometimes known for, which isn't healthy, is pat answers. Mm -hmm. You know, like the idea that, okay, in this situation, here's exactly what I say. Mm -hmm. And like just this rehearsed mechanical, like that's not good either. I also recently heard someone say that he was like sitting around with a couple guys, his friends. Yeah. And they started talking about... Um, like what certain girls were wearing. Mm -hmm. And he said, like, it went on for a minute, and then he just stood up and said, um, I, I've been really open with you guys. Like, you know, I struggle with pornography, so even, like, a conversation like this is not healthy for me or productive for me. Yeah. So, you like, you, it's fine. Whatever you guys want to do, like, I'm just going to take off. Yep. And he said, like, obviously that probably makes you feel weird, uncomfortable saying that to someone but he said like multiple of people in that group contacted him and was like that was really impactful what you're go what's going to happen when you do something like that is you're going to alienate some people mm -hmm. you're going to push people out of your life and you're going to change other people's lives mm -hmm. because they had critical you had the guts to have a critical conversation with somebody i've mentioned before that in my own past somebody had a conversation with me about mm -hmm. this or i had a conversation and, uh, and you're going to change other people's lives. And it's it's dramatic and it's cross-like in the sense that some people turn away from you in disgust and other people are drawn mm -hmm. towards you mm -hmm. in um, appreciation. So I feel like we should be looking for those opportunities. Uh, at the very least, ready for them. Uh, devotional thought number three. Uh, spiritual truths are spiritually discerned. This is... There is a great statement at the end of this chapter, and I'm just going to reread it here from my NIV translation. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, the, This person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, uh, but considers them foolishness, and they cannot understand them 
because such things are discerned only through the spirit. They're spiritually discerned. Now, what does that mean? To some extent, it means adjust your expectations of the world. Stop expecting the non-believing secular society to have the exact same belief system and value system as what the Bible purports. Why should you expect somebody that does not have the spirit of God to value the same things Mm -hmm. as somebody whom the spirit of God dwells inside of? And I think Christians will in general be less frustrated if we adjust our expectations about the world. Understanding that everybody in one sense has a natural knowledge of God. Mm-hmm. The natural knowledge of God is the in, uh, some sense of inherent morality and conscience. Mm-hmm. But gospel appreciation and gospel motivation, we talked mm-hmm. about motivation ago, that is only possible, according to what Paul is saying here, that is only possible uh, for those in whom the Lord's spirit dwells. Mm-hmm. So don't expect the world, when you, when you look at things on TV and you look at our society, we're not, America is not Christendom. Mm-hmm. So when you look at stuff on TV and you look at, listen to the radio and you see movies and you see stuff on the internet. Or you, even like what the government decides is or is not acceptable. Yes, I can't believe we live in such a land where, why would you expect somebody that is not in the church somebody mm-hmm. that is uh, well paul circles back to this thought in first corinthians 5 he says what job is it of mine to judge those who are outside the church mm-hmm. and what christians so often do is and you can see the historical pattern of this as as like america became less christian the christian uh, at least the vocal christian majority what they did is they grabbed onto politics mm-hmm. to try to assert their authority more And said, no, you don't want to be, like, if you're not going to act like a Christian, I'm going to take uh, a hammer and force you to act like a Christian through legislation. Mm -hmm. As opposed to letting the church do its job of trying to encourage the world through the gospel and spread, change people's hearts rather than just control people's and chain people's Mm -hmm. uh, behaviors. Yeah. Uh, It did nothing for politics in America. It did nothing for the vitality of the Christian church, which is why for the past 30, 40 years, the church has continued to shrink. Mm-hmm. as far as participation because uh, young adults are increasingly seeing um, people try, Christians, people who call themselves Christian at least, trying to assert their way and their mm-hmm. lifestyle by way of politics, not through gospel proclamation. And that is, that's why do you expect those outside the church to be able to value the things of the Bible? Because those things are only spiritually discerned. So don't worry about what mm-hmm. they value or don't value share the, the good news of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's hard to know really, like, as a Christian, what to support or not support. Um, so unless it's, like, a human rights issue, which even that, I feel like, is subjective, what you consider human rights. Like, do you consider health care a human right? Right. I do consider access to medical care something people should have. But I also consider the right to life a human right, Mm -hmm. you know, where some people would argue that would consider it the other way. So it's hard to know what to like put put yourself behind politically. So like I almost put myself behind nothing. I think instead of first asking what should I do, I think it's maybe a step even before that is what should I expect from Mm -hmm. the world? Mm Mm-hmm. I like I, adjusting my expectations of the world. If this world is, if the Satan is like the prince of this world, as mm-hmm. Jesus himself says, and if the spirit only dwells within the church, i.e., like God's people, mm-hmm. what should I really expect from the surrounding, from the world around me? I like I do expect there's a natural knowledge of God and an inherent sense of morality out there, but the idea that it would be perfectly calibrated mm-hmm. to what the spirit teaches is so foreign to Paul's mindset here. Yeah, well, and maybe being so concerned with like, oh, I have to get certain a certain person into office because that's going to guarantee everyone has access to medical care. Like, if, if Christians really just did like what the Bible said and took care of the poor, the widows, the foreigners and the orphans yeah it would take care of so many of those issues you're like fighting politically for the power of the movement would be so strong if christians i mean like even just like yes do that start with prayer if christians spent as much time in prayer praying Mm -hmm. for the country as they do lamenting certain politicians or whatever like how but very few christians that i hear complaining about Mm -hmm. um government or whatever and i ask them okay so how much have you been praying about this recently 
will are willing to say like you know they'll they'll admit yeah i've been praying for this a lot Mm -hmm. like maybe in some kind of token way but clearly it's they're trying to create what they understand and believe to be a good thing but they're trying to create it through worldly means as opposed to the means of the spirit which is the spiritual Mm -hmm. disciplines of prayer and gospel proclamation and compassion and loving ministry that kind of way yeah so like if you were really um felt extremely strongly about like abortion is it more impactful to like stand outside an abortion clinic with a sign or would it be like more impactful to adopt a baby that someone didn't want correct there are all sorts there's some interesting organizations right now um uh, i'm forgetting the one in atlanta it was in a book that i read a number of years ago i think called next the next christians it was basically saying how the christian movement has gone from a politicized yes we're going to picket abortion mm-hmm. clinics to an understanding at least from some christians that like maybe it would be more effective if we handed out literature to anybody who was considering abortion or tried to positively do that and then we also offered uh financial support at great cost to ourselves to women who are considering making these decisions uh, we offered an adoption agency by which we could say, yeah, we'll get, we'll make sure that your child is placed into a loving home mm-hmm. that will care for that, you know, uh, disabled or handicapped mm-hmm. child or whatever. Like maybe instead of just like, it doesn't cost anything to make a picket sign. Mm-hmm. It costs a lot to say, I'll raise, uh, uh, a child with disabilities, mm-hmm. but like to say, to do that, like yeah. that, that's more of a cross to bear in a sense, mm-hmm. but like, that's the way the world gets changed through Christians embracing crosses, mm-hmm. not through Christians trying to crucify people on crosses. Yeah. You know, um, any final thoughts on first Corinthians two? Nope. All right. That's Would you mind closing us with a prayer? Mm-hmm. Do you want me to close this with a prayer? Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Heavenly Father, your truth is spiritually discerned. And what that means is, uh, as Abe mentioned earlier, I can read through 1 Corinthians 2, and unless your spirit reveals stuff to me, it's just words. It's just flowery language and speech that I don't understand and an ancient context and people I've never met and that sort of thing. Um, But if your spirit actually lives inside of us, and if this is your spirit's word, then you can uh, ignite these words in our hearts, make them real in our lives, and help us submit to them. We're asking you to help us do that. Uh, Lord, we don't stand a chance of understanding your will unless you reveal it to us and break it into our hearts and minds. So please help us to humbly receive it and humbly submit to them. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for studying with us. We'll see you tomorrow for 1 Corinthians chapter 3.